The Little Incidents of Life A little incident has always been able to brighten my day, and fortunately I have the kind of job where things happened. There was that letter from the Bramleys that really made me feel good. You don't find people like the Bramleys now. Radio, television and the motor car have carried the outside world into the most isolated places so that the simple people you used to meet on the lonely farms are rapidly becoming like people anywhere else. There are still a few left, of course, old folk who cling to their ways of their fathers. And when I come across any of them, I like to make some excuse to sit down and talk with them and listen to the old Yorkshire words and expressions which have almost disappeared. The Bramleys were, in some ways, unique. There were four of them, three brothers, all middle-aged bachelors, and an older sister. Their farm, Scar House, lay in a wide, shallow depression in the hills. There was, in fact, no road to the farm. But that didn't bother the Bramleys, because the outside world did not attract them. A call to Scar House always came as rather a jolt because it meant that at least two hours had to be removed from the working day. One February night, at about eight o'clock, I went there to see a horse with colic. After twenty minutes of slithering in and out of the unseen puddles and opening a series of broken, string-tied gates, I reached the farmyard and crossed over to the back door. I peered through the kitchen window and saw in the interior, dimly lit by an oil lamp, the Bramleys were sitting in a row. They weren't grouped around the fire, but were jammed tightly on a long, high-backed wooden bench which stood against the wall. They were not asleep, nor talking, or reading, or listening to the radio. In fact, they didn't have one. They were just sitting. I stared, fascinated, and it occurred to me that this was probably a typical evening for them. A month or two later, I discovered another side of the Bramleys when they started having trouble with their cats. I knew they were fond of cats by the number and variety which swarmed over the place and perched confidently on my car bonnet on cold days. But I was unprepared for the family's utter desolation when the cats started to die. Even today, with the full range of modern antibiotics, the treatment of enteritis in cats is unrewarding. In those days, I had little success, though I did my best. The Bramleys were stricken as they saw their cats diminishing. I was surprised at their grief because most farmers look on cats as pest killers and nothing more. But when Miss Bramley came in one morning with a fresh consignment of invalids, she was in a sorry state. She stared at me across the surgery table and her rough fingers clasped and unclasped on the handle of her basket. Is it going to go through them all? She said sadly. Well, it's very infectious and it looks as though most of your young cats will get it, I replied. For a moment, Miss Bramley seemed to be struggling with herself. Then her chin began to jerk and her whole face twitched uncontrollably. She didn't actually break down, but her eyes brimmed and a couple of tears wandered among the network of wrinkles on her cheeks. I looked at her helplessly as she stood there. Strands of grey hair straggling untidily from under the black hat, which she wore, pulled tightly over her ears. It's Topsy's kittens I'm worried about, she gasped out at length. There's five of them, and they're the best we've got. I rubbed my chin. I had heard a lot about Topsy, one of a strain of incomparable ratters and mousers. Her latest family were only about ten weeks old, and it would be a crushing blow to the Bramleys if anything happened to them. What could I do? There was, as yet, no protective vaccine against the disease. Or, wait a minute, was there? I remembered that I had heard that the laboratory people at Burroughs were working on one. I pulled out a chair. 
Just sit down a few minutes, Miss Bramley. I'm going to make a phone call. I was soon through to the laboratory and half expected a sarcastic reply, but they were kind and cooperative. They had had encouraging results from the new vaccine and would be glad to let me have five doses for Topsy's kittens if I would inform them of the result. I hurried back to Miss Bramley. I've ordered something for your kittens. I can't guarantee anything, but there's nothing else to do. Have them down here on Tuesday morning. The vaccine arrived promptly, and as I injected the little creatures, Miss Bramley extolled the virtues of the Topsy line. Look at the size of them ears. Did you ever see bigger ones on kittens? I had to admit that I hadn't. The ears were enormous, sail-like, and they made the kitten's pretty little faces look even smaller. Miss Bramley nodded and smiled with satisfaction. Aye, you can always tell. It's the sure sign of a good mouser. The injection was repeated a week later. The kittens were still looking well. Well, that's it, I said. We'll just have to wait now. But remember, I want to know the outcome of this, so please, don't forget to let me know. I didn't hear from the Bramleys for several months, and had almost forgotten about the little experiment, when I came across a grubby envelope, which had apparently been pushed under my door. It was their promised report, and was, in its way, a model of conciseness. It communicated all the information I required without frills or unnecessary words. It was in a careful, spidery scrawl, and said simply, Dear Sir, them kittens is now big cats. Yours truly, R. Bramley. <laughs>